I'll, I'll start now. Good morning, everybody. We have here as a guest, Max Seck. Max is a former marketing professional turned into a top selling author. His, his first thriller was published only four years ago and now the rights of his books have been sold to 38 countries. And last year, an American production company announced that they, are, they have acquired Max's fourth thriller, The Faithful Reader, for a TV series adaptation in, in Hollywood. And last week, Max published his fifth book, which I'm halfway through right now. <laughs> so Max, great. welcome very much. Uh, Thanks for having me on board. Thank you. Thank you, Max. So we'll start right away with a question from a student. Uh, can you tell a little bit about your background in marketing and where did you work as a marketing professional before you turned into an author? Yes. Um, well, I studied in 2005, 2008, I studied uh, marketing and finance, both as my majors in, uh, in Tallinn, Estonia, actually. Um, I really don't know why I went there. I'm, I'm, I'm from Helsinki myself. And I think after finishing my military, I didn't have time to apply to any school. So uh, me and my couple of my friends, we, we applied to, to Tallinn. It, it was called International University Audentes in Tallinn and it was a business school. So that was the first time I, I got a hunch of, you know, what is marketing and, and I was also interested in, in finance and banking and, and such. So I, I studied both marketing and finance. I did my MBA mainly only about finance. I finished and then I worked one year in a bank, in Danske Bank, um, which I, I found it okay at the time, but it wasn't creative enough for me, I think. So then I started finding, you know, more creative jobs. I, I, at that time, I think it was 2010, I, me and a couple of my friends, we founded a marketing company. It was originally um, concentrating on, on digital marketing, but then we moved on to all sorts of marketing. And I, I think I worked there for a couple of years, I think four or five years altogether. The company still exists, but I haven't been a part of the everyday life, everyday team for many, many years. But that was the time, 2010, 2015, I did all sorts of marketing. We did all, you know, with all kinds of products, all kinds of services. And that's where I learned quite a bit about um, how to, you know, bring things like different products to, to people's knowledge. And it was really interesting. Okay. Were you more like a copywriter or art director or, or the contact person, the salesman? I was, uh, I was at all pretty much, you know, we, um, as an entrepreneur, we were just a couple of guys. So we, we had to do it all by ourselves in the beginning, at least. And, and I did a lot of sales. I was a salesman in Danske Bank. So I, I, I found selling, you know, always um, not easy, but it, it came naturally for me. And I did sales. I did some copywriting. And I think the copywriting I did at that time was later a really good, you know, standing point to my to my career as an author. Okay, very good. So here's another question from student. Uh, when and how did you then turn into a full-time author and, and uh, or was it a lifelong dream or, or what, what happened? Oh yeah, it was, it was definitely a lifelong dream uh, to be, to be a, you know, to, to work within a movie industry or, or similar. Uh, I didn't want to become a writer per se, but I definitely wanted to, you know, create stories and, and um, do something really creative. And 2013, I was on a holiday with my girlfriend, then girlfriend, now wife. And um, I just got tired to be just lying in the sun. So I went to my hotel room and just started writing because there, there was this phase of two years. Maybe all my friends told me that, Max, you should really try to write because I had this urge to, to do something creative. So I did. And at the time, it was 2013. I didn't know if it's going to be a book or if it's going to be um, something else, like a story I would just publish online. But uh, eventually, 2015, it, it was a full manuscript, like a full book, and I sent it to a publisher. I had no idea how that works. And just, I just hope to get published. And uh, I did. And not only did I get published, but I also, Tommy, my, my still publisher, um, they invested a lot of time, a lot of money to make it big. And that's one of the, uh, the interesting things I'd like to, 
um, you know, bring up today that um, I do think my books are good. I think I'm allowed to say that I like, um, I like the product. I think it's important to be able to say, I, I think my books are good, but that's not enough. We also need, you know, a lot of money for the marketing and um, distribution and communications. So I was uh, really lucky in that sense that my publisher provided me with all that professionals, you know, within marketing and, and, and communication. So they only didn't invest money in the book, in the marketing, but they only pro also provided me with the possibility to be, you know, seen on, on TV and, and in newspapers and stuff. That was their professional way to, you know, they, that, that, that was their input, really. Okay, that's really nice to hear. Uh, going a little bit back, uh, you said that you wrote basically like two years. Did it, didn't you seek or get any feedback from uh, publishing houses before you, you so how, how could you stay committed so, so long time without actually knowing that will it, will it work out? It's not beer, by the way. It's, it's not. <laughs> um, I did. I I didn't get any any uh, feedback from the publishing houses. I I had a friend, Mare Turka, a family friend who was a a journalist, and he she wrote a couple of books herself. Maybe you've heard of her, but she was the one who um, read my first hundred pages. And I it's it's not. I mean, publishing business is not really about knowing people because if if your book is good, it's like singing. If you cannot sing. It doesn't help to know a producer. Uh, that's, that's how the way it is. And in writing, it's pretty much the same. You might get your book sooner to the, you know, in front of the eyes of, of, of some um, editors. But if it's, if it's shit, then, you know, you won't get published, period. So my, uh, Mare Turka, my friend, she read it. And the only thing I was, you know, hoping to, to hear that she likes it and, and she, she sees potential in it. Because, and I told her to be like really honest, just be super honest if it's good or not. And she liked it. And that's one of the reasons I kept going and, and she gave me some hints. So if she would have said this, Max, this is not, this is, don't quit your day job. I, I, maybe I wouldn't have finished the book in the first place. Okay, but it's, that's uh, really shows the importance of having having inspiration and and also I, I must say that you have had like uh, lots of persistence with with the project. Uh, did did you say that did you send it to several publishing houses or only one? I sent it to several. That was uh, this tactic called the shotgun way. That I just I looked up the email address of every publisher. And I just, I send it everywhere. And I, I think eventually I got three different, like mails from three different publishers, but Tommy was the first one to contact me. And, um, you know, I was so happy. I, I just, I went with it the right away. And I think it was the, the right decision. You know, I just, I'm, it's a really good team and I'm in the right place. How, how long did it take from Tommy to respond to you? Like, did you wait for a day or a week or a month? Uh, three days, three days. Yeah. That's really good. <laughs> it was fast. Yes. I don't think that's the usual way how authors break no, through. No, I was lucky in that sense too, because my editor, who I'm still working with, uh, Petra Maisonen, she was just browsing her email and she saw the title, the Angel of uh, Hammurabi Nenkeli was the title. So she just saw the title and she went, okay, that's interesting. And she opened the mail and, and read, I mean, she had, I think she would have had like 25 manuscripts before my manuscript, but she just have, uh, decided to read it and, and she liked it. And that, hence the three days. I mean, it's, it was really fast and I was really lucky. Okay, that's, that's by the way, that reminds me of the in, importance of, of um, writing the topic of your emails correctly. That's... Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, you have very early, upon your career you have published uh, your goals and, and they are quite ambitious uh, like a breakthrough in Hollywood. Uh, how do you get this attitude? In, in Finland we typically don't do that but, but I, I, I find that admirable and, and where do you get the attitude? Yeah 
I think we I think we might even do it in in Finland. We just don't say it out loud. I think everyone has dreams, and then it just feels stupid to maybe in the culture it's not okay to say that I want to win an Oscar, I want to win the Stanley Cup. Um, I want both, by the way, but uh, I think I only had chance for the Oscar anymore. <laughs> There's some 35. Um, I've always said that, like, I I think it's it's always been cool to say that I want to do stupid things like winning an Oscar, for instance, because if you are based in Finland, it's almost impossible. And, um, but I think it, it's a, it's a, like basically a joke that becomes every year, it becomes less a joke until now. It's a real dream. And I don't really, to be honest, maybe it's just me, but I don't think that much what people think about my dreams. I really think what I, I, I care what people think about my books and myself, but not the dreams that much. So I've been able to say, and I think I recommend to everyone just to come up with uh, a dream or a goal. It's a cliche, really, but I think it helps. It has helped me a lot because if, um, because let's, let's, uh, as an example, let's take this, this Oscar dream. Um, every decision I make, I make to be, you know, to be one step closer to, to my Oscar dream. So I ask myself uh, if, if I should now move, uh, go to Brazil to make, I don't know, whatever, uh, if, if there would be a job offer, like let's say from a bank and they would pay a lot of money. And I would ask myself, does this bring me closer to my dream of winning an Oscar? And the answer would be no. So I would just, you know, I would stay in Finland and write my next book. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh if you want to share, it would be interesting to, to know what do you think are the steps towards an Oscar, like what, what needs to happen next and, and after that? Uh, yeah, um, well, the best thing that could happen did happen to me like last November when, when my, the TV and movie rights for Uskol and Lukia were sold to Hollywood. So a real Hollywood production company bought the rights and they are now writing, uh, writing them. TV series, and if everything goes smoothly, there will be a Netflix or HBO series of my book next year, or 222, uh, depending, you know, how 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 much time consuming the project is. But you know, um, we're really close. I'm really close of having a real Hollywood um, production from my, based on my book, and I think the next step is that once that happens, I will go to LA. I've been there many times selling and you know handing out my my business cards but once that happens i will go there and have you know hand out my, my, many 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 more business cards so yeah that's the next step i just you have to be there in in, in la to make that happen obviously but i'm sure i will try i like the proactive uh, approach of, of handing out business cards uh, what would be the dream outcome like that uh, somebody would uh, buy your already published work or that they would order something from you? Um, well, I don't know if they order anything from anybody, but I think I could just come up with a, my original screenplay ideas. I have so many ideas, like screenplay ideas, and I've, I've done screenplay writing and none of them have actually made into a movie yet. Um, I haven't been that active with them, but I think, I think, you know, once I get more name in the States, um, I will definitely come up with new ideas, write screenplays, and just try to meet the new, uh, right people. Because in LA, it's about knowing the right people, definitely. And and what you know, I am privileged in the way that I have an agent. Uh, you know, based in Finland, she has an, an office in New York, in London, and in LA. And Elena Albeck, and she has introduced me to many producers and you know the right people. So I mean, I, I'm not alone. I don't think anybody can make it alone. Uh, not here, nowhere. I mean, my agent, she's the one who sold 38 publishing rights to the entire world of my books. I've been, you know, assisting her, but she has made the sales work. Can you tell how did you uh, get into contact with Elena? Well, I, again, I'm lucky in the sense that she contacted me. She, uh, 2016, before Hammurabi Nenkeli came out, uh, she called me and she had read the book. She had a 
receive a, a free copy from my publisher and a couple of other agents contact me as well because I think it's a really good book and, and they saw a lot of potential in the book, like international potential. So yeah, she called me and, and she was so crazy in a good way. Uh, she wanted to conquer the world and, and she had really, you know, crazy dreams just like me. So she, she said, Max, let's, let's conquer the world with your books. So we didn't do it with Hammurabi Angels, uh, but we did it with the Faithful Reader, The Witch Hunter. That's actually coming out today in uh, in UK. As an English book? Yeah, I have it right here, actually. It's, it's, it's got the free copy. It's uh, okay. today in UK, it's the publishing. Yeah, I actually, uh, Max, I have it on my Kindle. It arrived this morning. Uh, Great, in my I'm Kindle. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm looking That's forward nice. to reading it. Super. I had a question about that though. The, the title is The Witch Hunter. Why um, did the title change? Because the Finnish title is about the, the killer and the English titles, I think, refers to the detective. Yeah. Why was that change made? Um, well, that's something I have no control over. Um, uh -huh. When the um, publishing rights uh, about Uskon and Lukia in this case is, is sold to, let's say, UK. Um, they will design the cover, they will do the marketing, the distribution, and they will decide a name that, that works best for that audience. Uh, yeah, they will, basically, they always send me an email, like, hi, Max, do you like it? But, and I always, I've learned to say, yeah, it's cool, because it doesn't really matter what I think. Uh, they decide, and that's a, a contract. Um, it's all in the contract, you know. They they buy the, buy the rights and they pay me royalties. They can't change the content of the book, but they can do whatever with the, with the cover and with the name. So I just you know brief answer to your question. I I don't know what uh, what the witch hunter refers to because Jessica Niemi isn't particularly chasing witches in the book. And she's not the witch herself. I don't know, um, but it's a cool name, and they thought it works. And it, it's it's called the Witch Hunter in the U.S. as well, and it it has many dif different names, uh, you know, across the world. It's crazy, and different covers. Uh, going back to the profession, how do you how did you how did you train to become an author? Like uh, I think it's really rare to write a write a success, successful book as, as, as your first book. So did you, did you actually learn the craft somehow? Did you study something? Uh, no, I, I didn't. But of course, you, let's say the first book required quite a many versions. So I wrote it once, I got some feedback, then I wrote it again. And eventually when, it's, it's, it's funny really, because when Tommy told me that they will publish the book, I thought, cool, now it's just, you know, it, somebody will proofread it and then, then we're done and then it's going to be published just the way it is. But the fact, I mean, it's, it's, it's really depressing moment when you get the, you know, the text first time with all those markings, because my editor really, she destroyed the book, <laughs> like in a good way. There was, in, on every page, there was, you know, something, this is not working, we have to change this. There were like entire pages, like not working, Max, take it off. And I was like, no, I love it. I, I, you know, this is the best part of the book. But then eventually I did take it up because, you know, she really knows what she's doing, my editor. And I, I, now I do trust her like 100%. But I think that's the way you learn to write. You write and then somebody gives you feedback. I, uh, you know, I have nothing against any, you know, writing class or such, but I never went to myself. Um, Maybe it's helpful, might be, so yeah. But uh, I just think, uh, you know, the really, really good way to get better is to do and then to get feedback. Yeah, I think, I think you said it very, very nicely here that you, you learn writing by writing, so. Yeah, I think you learn everything by doing, you know. Uh, there's another student question you, Briefly touched it's this already, but how do you sell your skills? Like, uh, like uh, when you when you come into contact with American production companies and so on. So, what what do you actually 
say and, and what do you try to achieve when, when, you, when you talk to them and meet them? Well, again, I, my agent is doing the selling pretty much. And I, everything I have to do when we go over to, to Los Angeles, I just have to, you know, try to say the right things and, and smile. And that's, you know, that's pretty much it. And, and convince everyone that I'm able to write and that I'm not using drugs or anything. So if they ask me, are you, be, are, are you being able to work the next five years? I will, yes. And my agent will do the rest. So even though I'm, you know, I've done a lot of selling myself, um, with, right now, I don't. I, I, I let Elena to do it for me. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually quite easy for me, you know, in terms of selling right now. Okay, okay, very good. Um, what advice would you give like a young student in, in his or her goal setting? Not not necessarily recording to, to become an author, but any, any, any goals? Well, it's, yeah, it's really difficult to give advice to anyone. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm usually really um, careful with instructing anyone. I think um, advising and, and about goal setting, I think what is required is always a, a short discussion of what people or what a person wants to achieve. But I think as a general rule of thumb, you could say just what I said before, that it's, it's quite important to set a goal. And, and I think you can always revise the goal. You can always change the goal. But it's always good to have one, like, like all the time. And I've, I've always had that. And I did like five, six, seven years, I did some work and, and I had jobs that did, had nothing to do with my, 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 my dreams. And I think it was, at the end of the day, it was pretty good. So I, I'm not saying I'm always, I've always done, I've always been moving towards my goals. And that's maybe a suggestion I, or a hint I could give now when I'm a bit wiser than 10 years ago, that if you think that you are in a work or job that doesn't, you know, bring you towards your goal, just maybe you should change the job, do something else. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Mike. There's um, a question from a, a student um, about those uh, earlier years when you were starting your own business. What was most um, important for you um, when you started a business um, in terms of getting that business up and running? Was it your formal education or did you have some other sort of source of uh, uh, resources that, were, that helped you to as an entrepreneur? Um, it was really a hustle in the beginning I, I i think when we did it we graduated from from the university and then we thought we know stuff but the fact that we didn't know anything uh we knew what's in the books and we, we you know we had to learn it all i think it would have been so much easier to, to you know work let's say for five years somewhere first in a big big company to learn more how the world actually works but then we started we were so young Okay, I did work one year in the bank before, but it wasn't enough to to make me any wiser. It, it was like constant practicing. We were doing mistakes. We were naive, um, but just like, you know, writing and getting feedback, I think that's how we got better all the time. So it's crazy to think now how, how little did we know about anything, about the, the business itself, about how life works, how people work. So it was constant learning and we did so stupid mistakes and, 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 you know, at some, in the very beginning, we had ideas and business models that didn't make any sense. So I think it's always, I don't know if I answer your question right now, but do I, did I? Yes, yes. And, and there's a, there's a follow up question. How has your career helped in, in, in the authoring, authoring career? So, are there something that you think you have that typical author doesn't have because you 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 have this uh, background as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I and I've been my 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 editor, no, my my publisher and my agent and 
so many others have said that it's, it's, it's easier to work with me because I know the importance of marketing and communications and, and all this like of, of sales because and I don't mean to generalize but it is a problem not only in Finland but I think in generally that artists authors musicians are not quite accepting the fact that you know even good work even even great paintings even good songs and even good books have to be marketed and you know Beatles didn't make it just because there were four nice guys they had a huge marketing um, machinery behind them and you know you take you can take any example from popular culture you know it's it's crazy there are always so many smart business people behind the successful bands orders and painters and what what have you so you know to answer the question yes i think my marketing background uh, has helped me so much because i i know this and i i always go to places you know especially when i was uh, after my first book launch i went everywhere i was asked um, because i knew that i have to be seen i have to talk to the readers so we'll get all the publicity we need uh, relating to this uh, you said you have had lots of ideas uh, how do you evaluate your ideas in in terms of marketability market ability like uh, how do you take the marketing in account before before actually starting writing something new well that's a really good question um let's say for uskol and lukia the witch hunter I was, I was um, frustrated because after writing three books that were really successful in Finland, we d still didn't have this international success. They were translated to a couple of languages, but not this huge success my agent, you know, uh, was so eager um, or was so enthusiastic a couple of years ago. I was waiting an international success. Um, we didn't have it yet before The Witch Hunter. And then we did this marketing research with my agent. So I asked her, what do people want to read abroad? And we and she basically asked around the foreign publishers and they found out that, you know, pretty much very simple. People want to read about a serial killer, a snowy Finland, like not this summer fun Vappo Finland, but a snowy, really dark, cold Finland. And a female lead like three things um, I never wrote about before. So then I decided, okay, um, well, I'll write a book with all these three, like female, female lead, serial killer in Finland in winter. And now we get to your question. I think um, this sounds that I'm really calculating, which I am, but everything else, the book comes, comes from the heart. I didn't make any compromises what comes to the content then i just you know i just wrote and i think it's um you, you cannot plan it too much if you plan a book according to what people want to read like the content like like the plot and stuff i i think it becomes i don't i don't think it becomes any good it can become but i think um the content has to come straight from the heart so that's something I will do in the future as well. I want to write about something I, I want to write about. I won't write about anything that people want to read if I don't want to write about it myself, if I don't want to read about myself. You know what, I'm, what I mean? I think it's important to be calculating, to think how to market it, but at the same time, just have to be creative and, and be an artist as well. It, it, you cannot be 100% business here. I mean, you can, be some, you can do some business in advance planning but you know still have to write from the heart you you don't have any worries there we can see that it's coming from the from the heart so no problem there uh, one question about the marketability uh, mika valtari wrote his main character in in egypt and and in 2000 years ago so uh, i i was wondering have you been tempted in into putting your main characters as americans and and uh, put the uh, happenings in, in, in United States in order to, to reach a wider audience? 
I could do it, yeah, but I, in, my, in my previous books, the Daniel Kuzma series, I had people from all around the world. There, there was this American as well who lived in San Francisco. He was one of the, one of the main characters in, in Mephiston Kosketus. And it was in, enjoyable, you know, to write about people around the world. But I don't think it, I managed to, you know, that, that wasn't an international success. So the first book, The Witch Hunter, that actually takes place only in Finland and has only Finnish characters. That's the one that became an international success. I think it's funny because I did write those Americans and, you know, French people in my books because I thought that, yes, now the French and the Americans will buy it because they have French and American people in the book. They didn't. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. And, and I, I, I find especially interesting the research, uh, the results of your market research that, that you need to have a the darkness and the snow about Finland. So that, that mm. was surprising results, really. Yeah, um, I think so too, yeah. When, when you write a book, uh, how do you take into account the possibility of it turning into a TV series? Well, I, I, always, I, I always listen to soundtracks when I write. I always had my headphones on and I'm always oh. listening to music that brings me to a certain atmosphere and mood. Uh, that really helps me writing. And I think that's because I love movies so much. I've always watched so many movies. I want to make movies someday. Um, I, I produced a couple of movies in Finland, but I really would like to direct the movie because I love the music so much. So always when I write, I always think about this could become a TV series or a movie. And I think it has helped. Uh, I think it really helped because when we sold the the witch hunter to, to, to Stampede Ventures in, in Hollywood, they said the book is very cinematic and that helps. It helps them to see that it would make a great TV series. I, I, I think they're right. I think I, that's the way I wrote it. I wanted to write it cinematic. Okay, very good. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience right now? Um, in, in, by, the way, by the way, you mentioned that you have produced a couple of films. What, mm. what kind of films are those? Well, they're very different from, from I've, I've been um, an executive producer in, in two Finnish feature films. The other one is, is Tauden and Joulu, and the other one is Swingers. They're both comedies and really different projects for, from, you know, for my books. I think it was refreshing and, and nice to, great to see how the movie industry works in, in Finland. How did you get into that? Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, you know, I, when I'm working within the books, I meet the movie people all the time. So uh, it's two, two different worlds. <clears throat> but very close to each other. So I, I do meet the movie people a lot. And then, you know, those movies always, they are created by someone and then more people come along on board. And I just at some point I met the producer and I promised to help with a couple of things like raising financing and stuff. So uh, the executive producer as a title it refers to uh, you know, giving something to the to the film, not creative uh, necessarily, but but in my case, I've been helping to to raise financing and and and, and yeah, yeah, that's pretty much it. I I read the script and commenting and and all. So okay, that's very interesting. Uh, we have a question, Penny. Can you read read it aloud? I I can read it. So so we have a question from the audience. Yeah. I'm I am writing fiction for the first time, but previously wrote and published non-fiction. Do you think there is something different about how you market and approach publishers in the fiction market compared to non-fiction market? Well, I, I never published anything other than fiction. So it's, um, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. But let's say from my publisher, Tammi, I know everyone after five years. I know the non-fiction people and the fiction people. And I'd say it's, it's okay. Yeah. 
I, I think I know what the difference is because when you do fiction, you you pretty much send uh, a manuscript. I mean, you write a book and then you send it, and if they, they read it, if they like it, they will, you know, publish it. They will edit it with you and then they will publish it. But with nonfiction, uh, what I've seen and he heard is is it, the works more that you go there, you have an idea. You ask them that if you would write a book about, I don't know, whom, um, say somebody. <laughs> Let's say, sir? Sibelius, for example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You would like to write a book about Sibelius. And they say, all right, um, sounds interesting. Are you capable of writing it? And then you prove it somehow. Maybe you have written already a couple of books or maybe you know, maybe you have 20 pages, so you, they see you can write. Um, I think the, the nonfiction works that way that, you know, uh, you might send, uh, uh, you know, a ready book, a finished book, but most of the time you sell the idea and then you will start writing it. They will maybe finance writing it, especially if it's some, if it's about somebody who is still alive. Like if, if it's an autobiography about, about Kalerma Kummola then I think, you know, the, the person is involved in the process, the publisher is involved in the process. So it's different, yeah, definitely. Okay. <clears throat> we have two more questions. Um, you said that in Finland, we are not as good in marketing art and entertainment as, as for example, the Swedes are. Mm. What do you see should be done differently in Finland? Well, I, I think it's about, I really think that, that the Swedes are better in marketing. And I don't know exactly um, why that is. I think the reason they are better exporting art. Let's take the books like the whodunits, um, crime fiction. They have um, Stieg Larsson, Lars Kepler, Jens Lapidus, uh, Camilla Lekberg. Um, they sell millions and millions and millions of copies of books. And the last 20 years, they've been dominating the book market all around the globe. So are Swedes better writing in writing than, than Finnish people? I don't think so. I don't, I'm, I, don't, I don't just come up with any reason why Swedes would be better in writing. Because you only need a computer and a, and a person who wants to write. So it must be a matter of marketing and exporting. So, and if you think about the music industry, um, how many international successfully rock bands, pop bands are there from Finland versus from Sweden. So yeah, it's definitely a matter of pro uh, producing and exporting. I think it's, it comes down to being brave and, and just taking what you have and loving it and showing it to everyone. I think what in Finland we might suffer from is a little shame. And I think in Sweden they are better in just writing, just doing the song and going abroad and saying, this is amazing. Buy it, play it, read it. Yeah, I, I Everybody will, you know, it will just um, automatically be taken more seriously if it's, if it's backed by your own people. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I think you, in most markets, you need to first be successful in your home home country, and then then you can go abroad. But I think you said it very well that the Swedes uh, are a little bit little bit more braver. So we, we need to we need to be we need yeah. to have courage also. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know if it has anything to do with this, but I've seen on 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 social media because I I browse uh, Facebook quite a bit, and I want to see what people write about not only my books but about literally um, in generally and it's crazy I, I I seem to run to comments quite a bit that say that I don't read Finnish crime fiction it's 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 bullshit I don't read crim, uh, Finnish crime fiction I only read the Swedes because they're better so I just I think it's um, it's unbelievable and I, I think everybody has the right to say that I don't read Finnish crime fiction. I think it's cool. You don't have to. 
but I don't think the the reason is that they are better. Yeah, it's it's you might think they're better, but the comments seem to indicate that that Swedes in general write better crime fiction, and that has something. I'm I'm sure that has something to do with um, I don't know, like like some some national feeling that we are not good at something, and uh, you know it's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. But uh, then uh, when we think about, for example, the Formula One or, or ice hockey, uh, it only needs one successful example and, and we'll hope it'll, it'll be you. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, so one final question. Can you tell a little bit about your day as an author? How do you divide it in, in writing and research and, and then what, what other parts you have as, a, as an author? Yeah, well, first of all, my year is divided in halves, basically. I write a book from uh, beginning of January until the end of June. So six months writing. Then I do some editing and, you know, revising the book for, for the summer. So the summer is very difficult for me to have a, have a holiday because we just finished the book, basically. It comes out in uh, August or th in this fall, it came out in September. And usually now it's COVID-19, so not too many, not too many events taking place right now. Usually there are so many events and we go abroad, we go, you know, everywhere. There are tours that take quite a bit of my time, now less. And uh, yeah, and then I will just uh, do other things. Uh, I have do other, I, have, I do have some other projects and uh, screenplays and some other businesses I'm still involved with. So that's really good time for all that. But uh, the writing process that become, uh, begins again in, in January for the next book is pretty much nine to five. I'm, not, I'm now at my office, so I come here and I do writing. I maybe do write three, four hours a day, like all together. And the rest of the time will just be research, interviews. Um, yeah, research takes a lot of time. I'm just going through articles. Um, you know, browsing books that have something to do with my subject. And I meet quite a lot of people. I, I interview police officers, uh, lawyers, doctors, even criminals, uh, just to get the, the little facts right. And I even, you know, even though I do all that, they, I, I, there are still always small mistakes that um, just stay there. It's crazy, but I try to be as authentic as possible. About the interviewing thing, can you can you actually approach people you don't know before? Yeah, I always do. Yeah, and it's 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 funny how uh, everybody is always glad to help. I I can call anybody. I mean, I contacted. I wanted to know what's like in prison uh, for one of my books. I never been to prison myself, and uh, I wanted to know how it's like. So I I contacted this. Um, um, ex-member from the Cannonballs um, who just had published a book about about the Cannonballs and yeah he was like yeah totally let's do it and I, I always thank them uh, at the end of the, the book the end credits so to speak but I've never ever so far um, met anyone or, or like received a no from anybody not from the police officer not from the doctor People want to help. I think people find this quite interesting, and people like to talk about their their jobs. It's funny, and it's great. It's really helpful. This is really really nice and encouraging to hear. And and um, I think you said it again very well that people like to help. I, I think that's something we all should learn to to uh, do more often. Just to ask for help. Yeah, yeah. I think people they feel better. Of, the, of themselves when they can share the knowledge that they have in their profession. I think uh, even even this for me, if you guys are asking questions that might help you, I feel I feel good about it. That if I can if I can give inspiration or or even small hints or ideas to somebody, it's always nice. Yes. I think this is a good point to, to thank you, Max. This has been very, really interesting and valuable. So thank you, Max, very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me and uh, have, a, have a great day. Yes.
Okay, thank you. Thank you.